let's let's uh, bring ourselves up to speed. Let's have, rather than me doing it, somebody give us a brief overview of Friday. Who wasn't here Friday? Anna? Okay. Um, let's just kind of bring ourselves up to speed. Somebody give us kind of a synopsis, a short synopsis of um, serendipity as we understood it, as we went through it on Friday. Who would like to try? Go for it. A happy coincidence or accident. And we talked about the different omnis. The omnis? Mm -hmm. Omnipotent, omnipresent. Oh, the, the force, the God, the infinite intelligence. Okay. And who can add to that? That's a good start. But serendipity is kind of like um, when you're going down the road of life and something happens and at the time you're, you might like it, you might not like it, but later on in life or later on you find out that that was the best thing for you. It stopped your goals of what you planned was good for something better. Um, and serendipity is it's kind of like the underlining, the underlining force or um, because of your atheists or not, but the, I guess the a God place in life where this infinite knowledge or creator or whatever your religious is, this knowledge, I guess, I'll just call it a knowledge. Hey, um, let's just call it God and be good with it. Okay. <laughs> if you don't like it, call it something else. But for the sake of everything we're going to do for the rest of the semester, I'm going to go with God. And if you have a problem with that, then get over it. <laughs> Thank you. It makes it so much easier to say God. It's the kind of the God factor of it where he infinitely knows best and will direct your life in the direction that is better for you than what you thought. Okay. Does anyone else want to add anything to that? One thing that I just kind of like when she was talking about the omni, <laughs> the omnipotent, om omnipresent, and omniscient, so all powerful and then everywhere, kind of, and then all knowing. So I like the idea that if God is everywhere, and that means not only outside of ourselves, but inside mm -hmm. of ourselves. So there's a part of us that's all powerful and all knowing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that, like, I guess our subconscious kind of knows the, the best path for us, even though our conscious may be looking towards a good path. So you just mm -hmm. have to trust that the mm -hmm. subconscious knows a better path for that. Mm -hmm. It does, yeah. And that's a nice nutshell. Those three um, summaries. So what I would like to do today is kind of expand a little bit on what, what we went over Friday and then um, I'd like to kind of give you some ideas for how to make this a working principle and in order to do that I'd like you to have this page in front of you and put everything else away. Just put everything that's not associated with this away. Um, did you get one? Okay, so I'm going to split you up. Here's what I'd like to do. Let's have you two work together, you two work together, you two, and then you two work together, you two. Let's have you, let me see, let me start here. You two, you two, you two, you two, you two. You turn around and you two. So I'd like, let's see, I'd like you guys to do number one, number two, and I'll tell you what to do. Three, four, five, six, six, seven, eight, nine, eleven, twelve, and thirteen. Okay? Um, now, what I mean by that is there, uh, on this page there are um, fifteen different kind of ideas that are associated with serendipity. And what I would like you to do, the two of you just kind of Mm. talk about what that probably means in relation to everything we've, we discussed on Friday and then I want you to think of possible examples, real or made up, preferably real, that would be the application of that idea. Okay? And then after you've discussed it, we'll ju just for like three or four minutes, then we're going to um, create a, a little discussion, an open class discussion about what you 
you know, talked about the two of you, okay? So just take a few minutes with the one and I'll walk around and help you if you have any questions about what, you know, what it's trying to say or what, what it means and I'll, I'll try to assist you with it some. But go ahead and just um, chat with each other, okay? Okay. So everyone kind of turn this way. Um, let's, let's have a little chat about these items and see what you came up with. And I'd like you to just really stay, you know, keep this in mind. I mean, stay focused on this. Don't, don't wander off to other things for just a, a minute and, and see what kind of thoughts as you're having, as we're having this discussion, see, see watch what thoughts come to your mind, okay? Um, see what kind of insights as you're listening and thinking and, re and referring to your own experience, watch what bubbles up for you, okay? So, number one, let's start with you guys. Tell us the sentence and then uh, I mean, what did you learn or what do you think you could um, get from that sentence and then experience as a possible. Okay, our students learn to expect the unexpected good in the unexpected. So we could pretty much always accept good no matter what happens. So always expect good no matter what happens. So if <laughs> anything happens, you just always want to turn whatever happens to be good. So um, okay. my experience, um, so I got injured, it helped me to focus on school during the summer and now I'm closer to my end Okay, good. Yeah, mine, I kind of found my major just by testing a whole bunch of different classes. Like, oh, let's go here, let's go here. I know what I was going to do. I just didn't know how I was going to get there or what the technical major was called. So mm -hmm. I came to the class and went, oh, this is it. That's good enough. Okay. Um, can you think of any bigger, excellent examples? Can you think of any? Like when you look at the bigger, like historical view of the world, does anything come to mind that is um, where you went? This is horrible. You know, when you think this is horrible, where when you say look for the the unexpected good, there's so many things in the world that are really really horrible. When you think about them, where, how do you find that? good in them. You Diana? say historical and it, it's just like 9-11 came to my head. Mm -hmm. um, to my mind where, I mean obviously an unexpected tragedy that hit New York, but also, you know, globally mm -hmm. was seen as such a devastating act. Mm -hmm. um, but the, like, okay, so the unexpected good that comes out of that, not so much what the military, decide, what our government decided to do, on a military scale, but more on a human <coughs> scale, how everyone came together to mm -hmm. support each other. How um, New York, which could be known as such a cold place and nobody cares, and everyone's walking with blinders on, how, how that city mm -hmm. really grouped together to rebuild not only the actual building, but to rebuild the feeling of strength um, mm -hmm. to support each other. You watch those um, episodes that have uh, documented the events of 9-11 <coughs> after and spoke, you know, they interviewed the people who survived. Talk about the people who gave their lives mm -hmm. for another, mm -hmm. and that's pretty amazing. That's something amazing because you've heard it is. how wonderful humanity can really be. Yep. In the depths of tragedy, the goodness of humanity came out glowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good example. Okay, number two. Thank you, Diane. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so the thing called chance may actually be a thing called life waiting in the fullness of time. Accidents. Okay, so what we thought of commitment was like looking back on what has previously happened and realizing that it wasn't chance and that there aren't accidents. Everything happened for a reason. So even when the guy runs me over with a, in my car, that's not an accident now? 
I think it's like the way that you kind of. <laughs> that's going. That's that a really, really bad accent. Is that at the time it may just seem like something weird or like chance, or you don't really know why you made that decision or why that happened. But then when you look at it in a fullness of time and like a long, like you recognize that it led you to different paths that you needed or or something that was better, and that it wasn't an accident or it wasn't necessarily a chance. That it all was kind of part of a bigger scheme. So what example can you give us that would be? So the example that I thought of is just like really pertinent to my life right now. I actually could have graduated in communications this semester, mm -hmm. and that was my original major, but for some reason I didn't feel good about it. And so I needed to go to school this semester. I couldn't just not go to school. And so I was talking with a roommate, and she was interested in doing health promotion, and I was like, well, I guess I'll just change my major to that. And so Sounds easy enough. Like, it, like really, it was like, that's <laughs> kind of weird, but I guess I'll do that. And so then I switched over. And a lot of the classes that I've taken are things that I really needed to learn in my life at this point. Mm. And even though I don't think I'll graduate in health promotion, it was like there was a, a higher power out there who understood that there were things that I needed to learn and I needed to take a break from my major. Mm. Now communication mm -hmm. So and it looked kind of like an accident or chance or kind of weird. It seemed like a dumb thing to do since I could graduate this semester. But it was something that I needed to do to give me a better path. Good example. Good example. Did anyone have anything uh, else that's kind of like that, that where you go, that's not what I was planning at all. And it's great. I mean, I, I don't know how many times I hear about relationships that, man, I wasn't planning on being with him or her. I was planning on being with that person. And you couldn't have planned to be with the person that you are ending up with. I have a backwards story of that. A backwards one? Yeah. Me and this guy, we dated on and off. And it was more of a, his parents and my parents were best friends, and it was always the plan for us to get together. Mm -hmm. And the more time we spent with each other, the more we realized we didn't have mm -hmm. any feelings for each other. We were actually called to just be best friends, mm -hmm. which was by far the hardest conversation we ever had with our parents that we crushed. Oh. <laughs> but, <laughs> They'll get over it. Now that we have that friendship established, um, I mean, he's pretty much engaged to another girl. Mm -hmm. And I can support him in that relationship and he can support me in all the Nice. Um, so it's backwards. Mm -hmm. That's what it's always supposed to be. Good example. Excellent example. I've lost it. Um, okay, so <laughs> I. <laughs> I've been here for a week. <laughs> Got to make up. I'm I lost time. <laughs> Um, so I had uh, I, I have a job, I had a job, and um, another opportunity came my way. At the end of a relationship, at the end of the custody battle, and I saw it as a new chance. I was going to be in an office, I was going to be in the legal scene, I thought I had this newfound love for, not the legal system, but kind of law, and mm -hmm. um, I thought I wanted to be a mediator, I thought that I was too old to be a lawyer. And I don't have that kind of money to go to school for that. Mm -hmm. But before that, there were two roads. Go back to school now that I focus, <laughs> focus <laughs> on myself, or go into this new opportunity. Leave my current employer, take a chance. I was hired at this law firm, so I didn't go to school right away. Mm -hmm. I was I had no experience, but my lawyer hired me which was nice. I thought he saw something in me. And in the end, I didn't work out for the office's needs. I didn't meet their skill set. Mm -hmm. Apparently, that's when I was let go. Um, and then I went back to school. So it wasn't an accident that mm -hmm. I was given this chance to change my little scene from my old job to try something new, that it failed, because ultimately, I should have been going to school. Mm is what I feel. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't an accident that I was let go. Mm -hmm. if I had to move from my old job to give myself the space <coughs> to move forward. And looking back on that, you can see that looking forward, you couldn't have possibly foreseen that. And I might have yeah. back to school if that didn't work out. Mm -hmm. yeah, right, exactly. So I'm glad it did. Excellent example. Yeah. I'm from a border of like three different school districts in junior high and high school. 
And so I got to choose what school I wanted to go to. So for that, like I chose the one that all my friends didn't go to. Hmm. And so like that opened a new door because it led me into like, it was directed at like becoming a doctor, athletic trainer into that path instead of mm -hmm. just a normal public school or private school. So it opened my eyes to what I could become instead of just getting my general. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if you look back, the, the whole idea is when you look back and go, I couldn't have created that myself. There you are. Number four. Excuse me, three. Okay, our sentence is, uh, like many of the finest things of life, like happiness, tranquility, and fame, the gain that is most precious is not the thing sought, but one that comes of itself in the search for something else. And the biggest thing that we kind of first noticed in this one was, of course, the fame thing. Because it always seems, you know, people are searching for that notoriety, that money, that, you know, I want to be somebody. Um, half the time when they're on their way to that, you know, famous status or whatever, they find something better that leads them to a different path where they kind of realize maybe they don't need all that money, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, high, the, um, the hot life or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that kind of, I don't know, it kind of you know states in the happiness and tranquility thing like and kind of what we kind of got a little bit was if you maybe if you try too hard at I don't know being happy or tranquil in a way like if you're looking too hard for it you, you might not find it and you know hopefully something along the way you'll find you know maybe you take for granted things like I don't know you're looking too hard and you don't see that you're already happy or you're already kind of mm -hmm. so Jason kind of an example. Of, um, I don't know. As far as the example, like my whole life, I've been kind of had a goal in mind as like playing uh, professional baseball. Mm -hmm. And as I'm going towards that goal, everything looks great, but I'm kind of taking for granted everything else, like my you know family, friends, because I'm just on that path. Like I'm just like a rocket, just going right to it. So then I kind of forget about everything else. And now that I'm kind of over that stage of my life, um, I realize that all the stuff that I did take for granted was the most important. Mm, there you go. Like what? Uh, school, uh, family, mm -hmm. friends. Um, before I just was like, oh, whatever, I don't even care about myself. I mean, I do, I did care about mm -hmm. myself. But now looking back, it's like, I didn't really put as much effort into it as I you know, wish I would. Mm. Because I was so on that. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what I'm going to do. You want to be on the mound, seventh game of the series, and that's everything. Yep. Right? And the first and the fourth game. <laughs> right? And, yeah, that, that's such a good thing. I really like the phrase that Neil Peart wrote. Um, he says, The point of the journey is not to arrive. And I think that's the essence of it. The point of the journey, we still have the journey, but the point of the journey is the journey. And what you get on the way to, or accidentally separating from, that which we're originally going for. Um, I kind of have a thing on the sports side too. I also spend a lot of time in Affecting my abilities, and I think it's only until now, right now, that I'm trying to go over like in the high school system that I realized how much I gained during that time. Um, I had a relationship with my dad because he was my coach. Mm -hmm. um, it was a daily basis, we'd be out in the backyard in our batting cage or pitching, and uh, on a daily basis, or hitting or mm -hmm. doing whatever. And I only realized now how much I gained through that experience. Mm -hmm. um, just looking back. And the value of that, it sounds like, for you, is greater than wins yeah. and losses on the softball right, field. Right, Even though that was important at the time, mm -hmm. and that's why I was practicing this, because I wanted to probably see something the best, but now that it was way more important than what I was gaining. Nice. Excellent example. Excellent example. Thank you, both of you. Okay, four. Okay, um, four is be insightful, be philosophical. Trust your guidance. What you think is best may not always be the best. Um, to me, I think it's just kind of keeping an open mind 
always keeping your options open as to what is going to come because obviously what it says like what you think is the best may not always be the best. That's going to be the case in both of our lives. We have a few different experiences. Um, I was really looking to go to Baylor for school because I had mm. family in Waco and my husband's over there. Uh, <clears throat> Big name school. It's a great school. Yeah. And it didn't work out and I was a little bit heartbroken, but and then I came to Weaver instead and ended up being the best thing for me because I'm closer now to my immediate family. Mm. And, yeah. Very nice. Nice example. Did you have another one? Um, yeah. Mine was um, when I was going through my divorce. I didn't really have any when it says be insightful, be philosophical, and trust your guidance. I just did a lot of studying and a lot of thinking and trying to find out what was going to be the best for me, if I should fight harder for my relationship with mm -hmm. my husband, or if it was going to be best for me in, in my future to end that relationship and move on. And, and mm -hmm. so I, don't know, I, just, I definitely had to trust my gut and my guidance and of those like my parents. And um, I was seeing a counselor at the time, and just keeping an open mind with what he has to say. Um, yeah. And I got, definitely thought that was, you know, the one I was going to spend the rest of my life with, and I thought it was going to be the best for me, and obviously it wasn't I'm so much happier now. Yeah? There's no way. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I never knew marriage could be as good as it is with my husband now, because mm. it was so bad before. It wasn't good before. <laughs> I never knew that it was as bad as it was until I was out of it and mm. in a relationship mm -hmm. with my husband. Um, go ahead, Tara. I just want um, to talk to you. I think it's the same <laughs> She wrote off on me. No, um, I think a lot of times, well, this is me personally, when I'm in the heat of the moment, I become so irrational and illogical that mm. I put off my guidance and I don't listen to my <coughs> what I know is right, and it takes an outside voice to say, Tara, do this. Mm. No, it doesn't feel right to me. It doesn't seem right to me because I'm being irrational or illogical. It doesn't seem the best, but then someone on the outside can look in and say, this is what's right to do. You just have to trust mm -hmm. that they know. Mm -hmm. and, um, a lot of times they are, and in deep inside you know that it's right to you. And on the outside you're thinking, that's not right. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Your ego, it's a constant battle. I think it's really fascinating how we have a constant battle between our ego, which wants the glory, which wants the power, which wants the, mm, the I'm all of it, you know, it, it, it's all me. And, and I liked how you said it, your gut, you know, that, that part of you that's somewhere, and you pointed to here as well, where it kind of bubbles up the the intuitive nudge, there's that battle between the two, and this one always seems quicker, easier, more convenient. And this one sometimes seems, you know, it doesn't seem like it could, it's, it's not so quick and easy. And that battle and being able to drown that out and hear the intuitive nudges amidst the noise of our thinking is one of the biggest challenges and one of the most cool things that we can possibly mm, learn to do. And that's why I love meditation so much is because when you are meditating, that's when your mind is so drowned. It, it, the ego kind of says, okay, I'm not, there's nothing I can do here except say the word. That's all I got to worry about. That's, that's enough for me, okay. And then the nudges pop in. The intuitive mm, guidance pops in. Oh, go ahead, Stacey. Oh, okay. Um, and I was going to say, not to be <coughs> boastful or anything, but when I, when I was going through my divorce and I was 
being more insightful and trusting my gut and following the guidance that I received. I have zero regret for anything that happened. Things, <coughs> things went well for you. Or during the divorce. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's so many people that I know that won't even talk to their ex or can't even say anything nice <coughs> about their ex. Mm. And I don't have anything bad to say. I don't, I mean, yeah, it was hurtful what happened, but I mean, I'm so much better off. I don't care what happened. And I don't care. Like, I never nice. said anything mean to him. I never, I like how everything was played out because mm. I did that. I was, you know, I trusted my guidance and I did what that said. I didn't let my ego get in the way. Nice. So. Very nice. Buddy, are you raising your hand? Okay, I saw peripherally. Uh, was that a real raise of hand there? So is your gut, your, your un unconscious mind telling you, you know, this is what you should do, but usually your conscious mind goes, oh, I'll make up a reason why I don't do that. And it's kind of like you just move on and just keep doing the things that you, you know. Yes. Your gut keeps telling you something, but you just keep going, oh, I'll do that later or something. And then really, if you just listen to your gut, you can probably <coughs> I mean, even though it was hard to do, you, if you just did it, it would probably mm -hmm. help you to be happy. Or How many times have you heard, especially on tests, what are you here, what have they always taught us about taking tests? Trust your first impression, right? That's, the, the gut is the, or our intuition is that part of us, and I think it's solar plexus or wh whatever, um, that that's our connection to that omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresence that it, it knows the right thing, but it, it brings you the thought and when you have that thought, you act on it. You just, oh, okay. Because as soon as you question it consciously, then you're going, well, my past experience says that ain't gonna work. Or my beliefs about how my own limitations are going to say, that's not what I'm supposed to do. And so you might get that nudge again, and then after that, no more nudges about that thing. Okay, you don't want to listen to that one. But the more you listen to that and act on it quickly, the more that kind of conduit opens up. And so that moment to moment, you're going, well, I feel like I should be doing right now. Oh, okay. That to me is one of the most valuable, I mean, if you could have access to <coughs> infinite knowledge, which we do, just our ego is so, I'd rather be in control here. And we don't want to let go of that. We don't want to let go of that. Our ego does not want to let go of, because when, when you get those nudges, it's a letting go. It's a, it's a, I don't know what to do here. What should I do? Did you have another thought, Stacy? Okay. Thank you. Um, number five? Okay, go for it. I have one. <laughs> well, um, th and this was kind of one of those really big ones. Um, back when I was working at the bank, um, I had graduated in psychology and 
a lot of good that did. Um, as far as getting a job, I mean, I learned a lot of fun stuff, and psychology is a fun degree to have. Um, but I, I, there was a, at one point where I said, I, I hate being in the banking. I hate when I, I became a loan officer, and it just got worse. Um, being in that bank every day. And at some point, I just said, I don't know what, and you mentioned destiny. I said, I don't know what my destiny is. It's <coughs> not in banking. But after you've graduated from college, you know, pretty much you've burned all your other bridges, it seemed like, of how to get somewhere because I was in psychology. Well, that, that means I can't be in business. That means I can't be in education. That means I can't be kind of, that was the, the limited thinking I had at the time. And, and at some point, I just said, I, I don't know where I'm supposed to be. I have a feeling that there is a destiny for all of us. I have that same idea that, that none of us is here by chance, that we all have a purpose. And I thought, I don't know what my purpose is. I love these things. I have no idea what that's supposed to look like, to be involved with them. And, and I pretty much threw up my hands, said, if that path's there, then God, intuition, <coughs> infinite intelligence, cheers. Next thing I know, I learned that there's, and it really was almost within a couple weeks where I learned that BYU had a health promotion program. I had no idea. I'd been in, uh, you know, six years of undergraduate school, and I never heard the words health promotion before. And, and then soon after, there was, somebody came up to me and says, if you want to go to graduate school, I have $10,000. And I went, OK, well, that sounds cool. <laughs> and, and I would be able to still live at home, you know, no expenses there. And I'd get to teach. I found out I'd get to teach while I'm going to school, so that would help pay for some of the school. And everything just started falling into place. As soon as I went, I don't know. And here is essentially what I said. I said, here. I don't know how to get there to my destiny. I have no idea. And, you know, 20 years later, this is fun. And I love every day doing everything that we're doing. We spent all weekend in that room over there, and we had a blast. Because I knew that it was creating fun things, and I see what we're doing in here. I feel like um, at a half century of life, I've finally, the destiny has been put into place, and there's no way that I could have planned for this. Not a chance that I was thought growing up, oh, you're going to be a professor, <laughs> a full professor, a published professor, and all this <gasps> useless stuff that I have. I just feel like I want to share this experience in kind of short on but um, kind of a long experience. But um, when I was 19, I got married. So I was really young. And two months after we got married, we found out we were pregnant with our first child. Mm -hmm. And everybody, you know, everybody on the outside, and we felt okay with that, you know, and just we felt okay, you know. With having the child? Yeah. Okay. And everybody on the outside was like, you know what, you got married too young, and now you're having a baby too young, you guys haven't even gone to school, mm -hmm. nothing. And so, you know, we had our daughter and we both decided to work and, you know, we bought a house because we were like, we're having a family and we just felt like we needed to go to school. And so, mm -hmm. you know, but we felt like we needed to continue on with our family since we had that first one, you know, just, we didn't want like a 10 year gap between our kids. Mm -hmm. so we continued on, we had two more kids, we ended up selling our house and moving into my in-law's house, which was really hard. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, the, all those years we're kind of wondering, like, why is this, you know, it's just so hard. Every, nothing's working out. And, mm -hmm. you know, we just decided to go to school. Um, and then, you know, kind of fast forward, my husband graduated in April. And the week after he graduated, we found out my three-year-old niece had leukemia. Mm -hmm. And it was a week after my sister had a baby. So she has a baby, finds out her daughter has leukemia. And then going into that, she found out that the baby is a perfect match, bone marrow. Her, her, sis, her sister. 
and we're kind of like, well, that's cool. And then we find out my husband has lupus, and it's a very severe condition mm -hmm. that came on really fast. Um, and we're living in my in-laws' house, which is on the Weaver River. And earlier this year, we started flooding. Mm -hmm. So we're flooding. My husband's getting sick. It's just crazy. We're like, why? You know, why is this going on? But he graduated in April, and then we started flooding, and then, mm -hmm. you know, and all horrible this. things and happening he right and sick left. Sick, and <laughs> yeah. And so we're like, um, and so the doctor called me one day. He's like, I need to talk to you because we need to treat your husband because he's not going to get better. He goes, however, the treatment is going to make it so you won't be able to have more children. And mm. I said, that's fine. We wow. have our three children. We're okay with that. We had our kids when we were supposed to. That's fine. Um, and then, so he, in the hospital and for weeks, and we finally get home, and we have a mass infestation because of the flooding. So our house is <laughs> filled with mice, and we're like, why are we having these mice? What is going on? And um, but you know, like we had our neighbors and ward members just step up and we didn't have a house payment because we're living in our in-laws house, they're on a mission, and so we're just living there. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have a house payment right now and um, we got the things cleaned up and the mice taken care of and we found things because of that, that with problems with the house that we didn't know were there. And so that got fixed and then, um, and then like he gets out of the hospital and I got in a severe accident like the next week Mm -hmm. and totally ruined our car and it was in the shop for like the rest of the summer but he was sick so he couldn't drive because he was on like drugs and so he couldn't <laughs> drive so I'm like oh we you know we still have that extra car and um but then we come to this semester and you know that was hard I mean honestly mm -hmm. everything in life is hard you know like everybody says you're supposed to finish school before you have kids but we are finishing school even though we have three kids it's working out all yeah. graduated in April he graduated and everything's kind of coming together and then I come to this class and I think finally everything is becoming understandable mm -hmm. you know where you question it like mm -hmm. oh my gosh and you know my niece she was treated she's cancer free nice he's doing much better um, has his final chemo treatment next week and you know and he's doing much better and everything and then I've used some of the techniques we've learned in this class on him like EFT yeah. and I think that going to school maybe I was supposed to wait mm -hmm. maybe I was supposed mm -hmm. to be in this class right now so that it would help me get through everything that's happened in the past and to know it happened I mean even with my religion I believe that but this class actually made it Mm -hmm. so much more mm -hmm. and you know so I just felt like I needed to share that experience right now I know we're over time dying to get out of here yeah no, everybody wants to leave but you know it's just everything works out and even the horriblest of situations that I've been through it's all worked out and we're doing great and I think it brought our relationship closer together and made us more thankful for the children that we do have great so. beautiful example and thank you for for risking sharing that because I know it's personal um, and we'll continue from right there on Wednesday. So have a great day, everyone. Thanks.